here we are in the western section of Palermo, and we are actually on an historic spot, although you would never know it from the scenery. We are on the Corso Pietro Pisani, and it is named for the great Baron Pisani, who did something remarkable on this very spot. He, when he came to what was then the mental asylum, it was called the Royal Madhouse of Palermo, and he volunteered his time. And he was horrified at what he saw, the treatments of the time. Patients were chained to walls and given horrible treatments and beaten and brutalized. And he said, this is not any way to treat the mentally ill. And he developed a whole theory that he called moral psychiatry. And it started right here in Palermo at this hospital, which he had rebuilt by the patients themselves. Sadly, this is what remains of it. You can see it's just a ruin now. If you look over the, the, the fence, this is was his hospital, and it was made with the patients themselves. Here, let me take you down the street, and I'll show you the front of it. They planned it. He had ideas that they would be, I have to make sure that I didn't get filled in the way, uh, that he would, here's the wall. This was the outer wall. And what, what happened was that um, he thought it was important that they get outside time. These were old gardens then. This was a part of the city that was not developed. And it was all open and countryside. And there was a beautiful courtyard that they built. And there's a beautiful plan. And all this will be on my website. You'll get to see it. And this is really what remains now. You can see the bars. It's sadly abandoned and overgrown. And unfortunately, there's not even a plaque which is too bad. But there is an homage and a memorial in his name, in the name of the street. This is real city life, but now you know what was here. We are in an amazing place because I have been digging and I have met an amazing man named Mr. Sebastiano Catalano. And he has taken to me to here, which is a simulation of an actual cell at the Royal Mad House of Palermo. These are the actual beds that they had here. They would be restrained, they would tie you to the bed. This is before all of them were formed. Here is an actual straight jacket that was used that Dr. Kasami later came and said, we will not restrain patients this way. Here's the actual clothes that they wore, the women patients. And you can see above the bed here, the mask cards that the, that the patients would collect. And above you see these um, funnels. And this is part of it, in a way, an art installation because funnels were used when patients would refuse to eat or drink. They were fed that way. And the sound you hear when you walk around is underneath my feet because it's a representation and a reminder because some of the cells didn't even have a mattress. The only mattress they had was leaves. And there would be a hole in the wall where people could go to the bathroom and then they would clean it out by cleaning out the leaves. And I just thought it would be really cool for you to see this amazing place which we were taken into by these experts on the Royal Madhouse of Palermo. It's really something. Well, thank you so much for listening to that because I know that the sound gets a little crazy, but I want to take a minute to step back and tell you a little bit about the story about Baron Pisani because what I like to do in these little videos, and I'll do it briefly, is to sort of give you an insight about what it's like to write a book like Loyalty, and Baron Pisani is really important to the book Loyalty, and I'll tell you, because one day I came across this little story of him, and just so you know, he was a real person. This is actually a picture of him. It's kind of a little cutie. They say he was short and stout. He was born in 1760. He was born to a very noble Sicilian family. And we've talked before about how the society was very stratified in Palermo in Sicily. The nobles were on the top. Only they were permitted to own land. Only men voted. It was very, very rigid class system. And he was born to this upper, upper class and he loved the arts. He loved music. He loved painting. He loved archeology. span He took himself on studies about archeology. span So he got to be sort of an intellectual and just follow what he wanted to do. 
He married in 1784 very happily. And then a really sad thing happened to him in 1815, which is that his son Antonio died and he died in his teenage years. And I wasn't able to find out why, but I, I just found the story when I was sort of reading about Sicily in one day. And when his son Antonio died, Baron Pisani was heartbroken. He fell into the deepest, deepest grief. They had a wonderful relationship, father to son. Here he is, you can see. He was a very kind man. He loved music so much. He taught his son to play instruments. They shared that hobby together. They loved to play together. They were very, very close. And when Antonio died, the Baron could not, he just could not get out of his grief. He said in some later writings that he was afflicted with melancholia. And we know now that that's some form of depression or melancholy. But imagine in the 1800s, he can't get out of it. During the course of his life in this depression, he starts to, there's a, there is a madhouse in Palermo. It is called the Royal Madhouse of Palermo. And that's what jumped out at me when I was first doing research. I said, wow, what a strange and really weird name for a place, but also so true to, it, to its time, but for our ears, kind of horrifying and wrong and insensitive. And what Baron Pisani did is he was trying to come out of his own melancholy. And he said, boy, this is um, these, there's really no treatment for melancholy by any psychiatry. And he starts to take himself to concerts. He returned to concerts. He didn't play. He would start going to listen. And then he would take himself to museum and he would look at arts and he would started to realize that he was healing himself, healing himself of his melancholia by his exposure to the arts. And it spoke to his soul again. And he felt himself coming out of this deep, deep grief and coming to life. And as soon as he did that, he realized that this was this journey they had just gone on. And this impossibly, this is really a long time ago. Um, he said, you know, now that I have seen what modern psychiatry offers the mentally ill, depressed people, melancholics like me, it's terrible. They offer nothing. And, it, and what, what he does then at that time is he, he goes to the madhouse, the Royal Madhouse of Palermo, and he, he can't even believe what he sees there. Later, he writes a book, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But this, I want to read to you what he sees so you can see it through his eyes because this ends up in loyalty, almost verbatim, because Baron Pisani is in, in, in loyalty. He says, the condition of abandon in which I found this place was absolutely unbelievable. It gave the impression more of being a menagerie for deer than a home for human beings. We'll come back to that. The patients were all locked together, no matter their condition, in dark and unhealthy cells. They lay on straw directly on the floor and were almost completely naked. They suffered from hunger and cold and were subject to physical beatings, punishments. Furthermore, many of them were affected with physical diseases, being in close contact with tubercular, leprous, and dermatological patients. Can you imagine? Because what the, the actual, at that time, the Royal Madhouse of Palermo was located in a former convent, which also housed lepers. So you would have somebody who was depressed chained to a wall next to a leper, next to tubercular. They were right in the adjoining wing, getting no treatment whatsoever. And for me, what I learned about it, I, I, there were so many things that I thought about, but for, for someone writing, trying to write a novel, we go, that is so interesting because what, what, what I keyed off of is when he goes, they're more the impression of being a menagerie for animals. And I thought that's a very interesting theme. If you remember last week when we talked about Pelagonia, that, that beautiful home, but it also had monsters. The whole idea of what is a human being? What is an animal? What is a monster? What separates us from animals, from monsters? Because that's what he confronted. He went into the darkness, 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 that is depression through grief. And he said to himself, I have been like these people. It made him see a commonality that he had never seen before, right? I mean, 
We, you all hope you have empathy. I happen to think readers have a lot of empathy because frankly, we're always going in someone else's position. But Baron Pisani, who had lived a life of incomparable privilege, didn't go into their shoes until he lost his son, saw the way they lived, and he said, this is wrong. And he didn't have a medical degree. He had, didn't have any training in psychology. He just said, I'm going to change this. And so he goes to all his rich friends in government. And in the meantime, he writes a book. Here's the book. When I read about the book, I, I was on fire. This was in the summertime before I even started, before I went to Sicily, before I started the research. And I said, I have to get a copy of that book. Then I realized that the book is in Italian. Great. We'll come to that in a minute. But I obtained the book through a rare book dealer online. Here it is. This is his actual book. This is a first edition. It's in Italian. It's basically Guide of the Real House of Madness to Palermo, written by Baron Pietro Pisani. You see the beautiful old fashioned font. There is the date 1835. 1835. The actual book written by Baron Pisani. I own it. Now, having gotten it, I said, well, Lisa, maybe you should have learned Italian instead of Latin. So what I did was like, I got to translate it. I paid somebody, my Italian translator, who translates my books in Italian. And I said, can you translate this? So I know what he said, because there's very little scholarship on him. I was only able to find maybe two articles and they don't go deep enough, not for me to write a novel. And what I learned was that he came out with a whole set of instructions that were a way for him to start a whole new theory of therapy, which he called moral therapy, because the foundation of what he said was, it is immoral to treat human beings who are suffering from mental illness this way. It's just immoral. In other words, it's just wrong. And so he went to the hospital and he said, first, you can never call that yourself Believe it or not, they called the superintendent of the hospitals the lunatic master. He said, no, but we're never going to use that term lunatics anymore. We are not going to label anyone. Do you realize that he started this hospital in 1824? Those forward thinking ideas, he was hatching 1810, 1815. We are going to treat everybody with respect, whether they're doctors or whether they're patients. We are going to put them on a course of what I, I take the chains off. Number one, you may never beat anybody again, never, no physical beatings. We will show kindness and respect to everybody. And furthermore, I wanna build a new hospital so that people with melancholy do not have to be living with people who have physical illness, especially leprosy and other things that are contagious and can harm, right? Thank heaven for, and here we are, and it's so remarkable. So he decide, he plans the hospital. Here is the plan of it, the outside of it. You saw with well, that big ruin that I was standing in front of, and I'll show you some other close-up pictures of it. But this is a drawing by him. He said, we're going to build this. We're going to move out of the convent, convent and we're going to put everybody in here. They're going to get to listen to music. They're going to learn to play an instrument. They're going to paint. They're going to be outside in the sun. He was a great believer in sunlight. Here's his little map of all the cells. He made a floor plan. This is actually it. It's in his book. And he, oh, we'll hold it this way. And this is actually where the cells would be. Men would be separate from women. Nobody would be chained up. They were free to go in and out. In other words, ideal. It was, and here, and so I wanted you to see what it looks like then, what the idea was. This really is a pretty good idea of it because I was so excited as soon as we got to Palermo, I went, I said, like, we go, well, let's go see this right place. You see all the, like, the, you heard all the noise about it. And you see, it's not in wonderful condition. It's actually fallen into ruin. It's completely empty. And I thought, gee, that's kind of sad because this great man, Baron Pisani, made this hospital. And you know what else is amazing about it? What was also important to him is that the patients had a, why am I shouting? Let me just shout at you that the patients had a hand in making the hospital themselves. And so they helped build what became their own residence and they loved it. And he even did a thing where he paid them a certain amount of money. And then he would kept very accurate books, which I've seen examples of, I won't bore you with, but that um, so that he could show the state that they were actually capable of having jobs, having purpose, 
They would have outside time. They could exercise. Here's more pictures. I'm going to take you through this picture real quick. If we could see a really beautiful building. Unfortunately, now completely in ruins. But what is so remarkable about this? There's so many things that were, were struck me and really got me so jazzed for loyalty. Is that when I first read about this, and you can see the, the construction fence, it's all, you know, kind of crappy right now. Here's me trying to not to look jet lag, but I was so excited when I got there because I had all these ideas when I went over there, you know? And by the way, here's a picture of what the convent was. This is the old convent before what he built. And you, you can, there's, there's just this yard, the cells are inside. This is it from the outside. Even this, not a beautiful place. He thought, for example, it was very important to have a garden. There was a beautiful garden at his hospital. Here, they weren't allowed to go out. They were tied, they were chained to the wall, naked, filthy, with their own chamber pots, starving. They say that the weight, they had very little weight on their body, just awful. There's me talking to these people who, uh, who know a lot more than I do. One is a historian, and the other is Dr. Catalano. I'll show you about his book another time, who's an expert on this field. But what was so moving to me first was the end of the Baron Pisani story, which was that Baron Pisani started this hospital in 1825, right, 24. And it became, it started to become famous throughout Europe. Now, because you have to imagine, as we've talked about before, Sicily was, had one of the highest illiteracy rates in all of Europe. It wasn't a center of learning. It was beautiful. Rich people went there on vacation. But it is remarkable to think about the fact that Baron Pisani completely is self-actualized. He decided this was the right thing to do. He willed it into existence. He helped all of those poor souls who lived lives of essentially imprisonment and horror. And he became dedicated to them. It's not like he walked away and said, okay, my job here is done. He stayed as their as superintendent the rest of his life. And in 1837, that's how long ago we're talking about, by the way, in 1837, cholera swept through Sicily and all the rich people got out of town, but he didn't. He stayed at the, his wife had died by that point. His son was dead, Antonio. He stayed at the hospital with his patients and he died of cholera with those patients that he couldn't save at the very, very end. And after his death, people started to really appreciate what he had done, that he became the so-called father of moral therapy. It was his idea. It was so enlightened at a time that was so dark. People visited, Alexander Dumas visited. In fact, he referred to Pietro Pisani in his book, The County Monte Cristo. Edgar Allan Poe visited it because this notion of um, what a house of horrors and a mental asylum could be, a, a house of lunacy, a, a madhouse. When I first read about that in research, I said, that is such an interesting idea. I wonder if that can be a book. And then when I went to Sicily, and this is why you do the research, you, you change, you, you, you have a germ of an idea, but it expands because when I got to Sicily, I was wait. This Baron Pisani is a wonderful story, but you're not going to tell that story. That's not all you're going to tell. You have to tell a story about the conditions of Sicily, like I'm kind of trying to tell you now, so you understand how remarkable it is. He wasn't in London and thought of a theory. He wasn't in France where psychiatry was pretty much advanced. He was in Palermo by himself, living through his own grief and going, I know how I can help people. I can heal them. So when I wrote when I wrote loyalty, I'm not giving anything away. Well, there's a kidnapping of a little boy on the front page. And where does he end up? In the royal madhouse of Palermo in the old days. And he spends, and I'm not going to give anything away, but he spent, well, it's a little bit, that he spends time there and he goes from human to monster, as you would. Because if you treat a human like a monster, they turn into a monster. And Basically, at some point, he encounters Pietro Pisani himself, and I don't want to say anything more to than that. But it really is the core story of this book that is really about Sicily as a whole. And I think, as I've said to you before, I, I know it's going to sound a little crazy, but I think the story of Sicily is, to a certain extent, the story of the world. 
that there's there's a period of beginning and there's a period of colonization and colonization until somehow law is given and set right and power is invested in the people who live there and then they govern themselves according to laws and they define justice for their families as they see fit. That's the story that I wanted to tell in loyalty. And I think that's the story it tells. And this all happens as against the rise of the mafia. And I, uh, I want to take a second because I see that Elaine Petrosino is here. And we mentioned before that the modern day mafia exists. Um, she has a relative, Detective Petrosino, who was from New York, who went to study the mafia and was actually assassinated by them. And I saw the uh, plaque to him in the square in Palermo. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, her. And I think what's so interesting about and it's kind of apropos because I think what's so interesting about history is that it's alive, right? It repeats itself or as, as I said in the Pigeon Tony story, which we'll talk about in the end, um, you know, people tell you not to live in the past, but you, but if, how can you not if history keeps repeating itself? That's Pigeon Tony talking and me too. So anyway, that's the story of Baron P Pietro Pisani. It is at the heart of loyalty. And this is where we turn to, uh, of, you know, we send the book out, as I mentioned to you, to, to booksellers early on as part of the kind of the business of publishing that I kind of want to let you in on. And some of them really, really loved it. And they wrote me back, wonderful, wonderful. Well, many of them loved it, but I'm not trying to brag. I just want to say, I will read a wonderful quote by Mary Weber O'Malley from Skylark Bookstore. And uh, she's terrific. And it's a great, great independent bookstore. You know, we always celebrate the independent books. I tour almost exclusively in independent bookstores. And I hope you support bookstores in your neighborhood because we need them. What she read loyalty and what she said is loyalty is a page turning, multi point of view and twisting piece of piece of historical fiction, a blockbuster novel. Woohoo! That made me so happy. And I also got to have my little Pietro Passani homage in there. Because what I love about what I do, and there's so much what I love about it, is that I get to sort of popularize it. So maybe you didn't know about him. And I think the idea that he was a grieving parent touches me. I think it would touch any parent or anyone who's been through grief and knows that dark, dark period when you have to get yourself out of it. And how lucky are we now? I still think we have so far to go, but we have, you can go to a therapist. I'm a big therapy fan. You can go to a psychiatrist. You can do all kinds of things. And Hopefully we eradicate the stigma about that. But can you imagine being at a time like him when you start to listen to music just to finally climb out of this hole of melancholy? So um, I kind of love that we get to tell that story. And I hope you can relate to that story as much as I am, because I thought it was just, and remarkable too, the power of one person just to change everything. He changed the course of his treatment, of, of his country, and he changed the lives of all of those people just because he felt that they should be treated like human beings and not animals. So it's remarkable. Pigeon Tony's last stand. I don't mind promoting this to you because it costs you nothing if you're on Amazon Prime. Please download it. And you also can download the audiobook for free if you're on Amazon Prime. It is now number one in Amazon singles. I am so proud of the story. And I will tell you, if you miss Rosado and Associates, and I miss them too, they're going to come back. If you remember the Tonys, if you remember Maddie Denunzio, if you remember Pigeon Tony and Tony from Down the Block and Tony Two Feet, they're all in this little story and they're saving South Philly. It is an e-book. It's an e-story because you can't make a whole book out of a short story. So don't, don't be mad at me. And I did it because Amazon said, do you want to write about a hero? And I said, boy, do I. And, uh, it's really, really wonderful. I will tell you that I listened to the audiobook the other day when I was driving home from New York after Francesca's birthday. It is read by Eduardo Bellarini, who is my super, 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 honestly, favorite audiobook narrator. He is sensational. And you know those Tonys, that's hard accents to do. And by the way, there's usually five people in the room. And so he managed to do all the different voices. He totally gets the Denunzio vibe. He totally gets Pigeon Tony, which is one of my favorite characters ever. Yes, I have a crush on an 80-year-old fictional Italian man. I don't know what to tell you about that. Maybe my Bradley Cooper crush is more socially acceptable. But please do get this. I think you will really, really love it. And listen to it. It's all free. It doesn't get better than that. Okay. Enter for loyalty because this is what we're giving away next week. 
as you know, all of these things are either Sicilian themed or Italian themes or relate to reading. This is something I also own because I can't help but buy myself these things because I love them. This is the Sicily collection from William Sonoma, right? Because Sicily is known for its porcelain. I think I showed you that stuff in another, in a previous video. And if I haven't, I will, because I've got some when I was there. I thank you very much for being here, for listening to me talk about my passion, which is my books and what's behind them and what goes into them. But above all, um, the sweepstakes and things like this are really a thank you for you guys. I, to, I'm thanking you for your attention, for your generosity, for your support. I've been writing, I've been writing for 30 years. I've done 35 novels, nine pieces of, you know, those memoirs with Francesca. You've supported every one of them. You have kept me employed and loving this job. So I get to tell stories that make us all happy. That's the point, but it doesn't happen without you. So thank you very, very much, everybody. And I'll see you next Monday night. Thank you again and stay well till next week.